Great. So uh, welcome to the second, uh, second class. Before we start, uh, I want to go over just a couple more logistics. Um, as a reminder, the optional homework zero is due on Monday next week. Uh, we also have a PyTorch review session tomorrow. Uh, I accidentally said that it was at 4 p.m. on the first lecture. It's at 6 p.m. Um, it should say 6 p.m. everywhere. Um, and that's going to be over Zoom. And you can find the information uh, about it on, um, on Canvas. We also posted the guidelines for the project. Uh, this, they should be fairly comprehensive and, and answer almost all your questions about the project. Uh, but of course, if you have any more questions about the project guidelines, feel free to either go to um, office hours or any, any of the TI office hours, essentially, or uh, you could also make a post on Ed about it as well. Um, we also have exciting news about cloud credits. So uh, we were able to get sponsorship from Microsoft Azure to provide us cloud credits. And assuming the enrollment doesn't change too much, we'll be able to um, give everyone around $100 in cloud credits for completing homework one, homework two, and the project, if you'd like it. Uh, homework one and homework two are going to use a GPU. Uh, and so that's especially why we're going to provide the credits, because not everyone has access to GPUs already. And we're going to provide um, a guide for getting started on Azure and so forth. Uh, and we'll provide that all on Monday, when, which is when homework one is coming out. Great, and then office hours also start today. Um, for instructor office hours, uh, those are going to be in person, and they're just in Packard 202 right after Wednesday lecture. Um, we're we're going to post more information about office hours as well, um, about signing up for the pre-scheduled office hours and so forth on Ed in the next uh, day or so. Great, any logistical questions before we start with technical content? Awesome, okay, so the plan for today is to talk primarily about multitask learning, and we'll talk about the problem statement, the model, the objective, the optimization process, different challenges that arise, and then we'll also <coughs> go through a case study of kind of a real world example of multitask learning. Then if we have time, we'll also cover transfer learning as well. Um, I suspect that we probably won't get to transfer learning and we'll just cover it in a future lecture. Uh, and so the goals of, by the end of the lecture are to be able to try to understand really the key design choices when designing multitask learning systems, also be able to understand, um, if we get to transfer learning, to be able to understand the differences between multitask learning and transfer learning and the basics of transfer learning. Great, um, so let's start with multitask learning. So first of all, I'm gonna introduce some notation so that we can all get on the same page with respect to the notation that we'll be using. Um, and this will be consistent throughout the course, not just for this lecture. Um, so we'll consider uh, deep networks in this course. Here's an example of a deep network. Uh, we're going to consider the input uh, to the network to be X, the label to be Y. Um, sometimes we'll overload the notation of Y to also mean the predicted label. Uh, so for example, maybe we want, we want to be able to classify an image as being a tiger or, or um, a tiger cat or a lynx or, and so forth. Um, X could also be a piece of text, like it could be the title of a paper and maybe you want to predict the length of the paper. And we will use um, theta to denote the parameters of the neural network. Um, so this all should all be fairly standard. And in most places, we'll use f to denote the function represented by the neural network. And uh, it will be representing a probability over the label space given an input x. OK, so this. Um, this is the notational setup, and then in single task learning, uh, in single task supervised learning, we'll be given a data set with x, y pairs. And we want to be able to minimize the, some loss function over that data set as a function of the model parameters. So a typical loss function might be something like negative log likelihood, where we want to be minimizing the negative log likelihood of the labels given the inputs. Uh, and this means that we want to our model to be able to match the labels, be able to predict the labels given the, um, given the inputs x. Great, so this should all be review for the most part, or just getting on the same page with respect to notation. Now, uh, what do I mean by a task? So last lecture, I gave an informal definition of what a task is. Uh, and now we'll go over a more of a formal definition. So the intuition is that a task will correspond to a machine learning problem. And uh, the way that I'll formally define it will be 
I, a, essentially, it'll correspond to this tuple right here, which has a distribution over, over x, a distribution over y given x, and a loss function. And essentially, each of these, these two distributions, p, are the distribution that generates the data. And the reason why it's helpful to define a task like this as something that generates the data as well as a loss function over that data is it means that we can sample corresponding data sets from, that, uh, from those distributions. So we can sample a training data set and a test set, and we'll assume that the training set and the test set are sampled IID um, or independently from these two distributions. Um, and I'm also going to use kind of DI as shorthand for DI train for the training data set. Okay, um, and if, if this is a little bit confusing, you could also just think of a task as simply having the training data set and the test set and the loss function. Um, it's helpful to, to think about it as the underlying uh, distribution in the sense that it allows you to sample these, these data sets and uh, potentially sample multiple data sets, including potentially a validation data set, for example. Okay, so that's what I'm going to define as a task. Now, uh, what do different what are different multitask problems going to look like? Uh, they, they could look like a few different things. So one example could be a multitask classification problem where the loss function might be the same across different tasks. For example, it might correspond to the cross entropy loss function, but um, essentially the data generating distributions will be different across the tasks. So um, as an example, maybe you want to be able to recognize um, handwriting from different languages and then you're still gonna be using cross entropy loss function in each of these cases, but just the distribution over X and the distribution over Y is going to be different because um, they're going to correspond to different kinds of characters in different kinds of languages. Um, as another example, maybe you want to build a spam filter and you want to be personalized for different people. Different people naturally receive different emails. They also naturally have a different distribution over labels. I'm, spam for me might be not spam for you or vice versa. Uh, and so this is another example where the loss function will probably be the same. It'll probably just be cross entropy, for example, uh, but the distribution over X and the distribution over the labels is going to be different for different tasks. Um, as another example, uh, maybe uh, the loss function and the distribution over X is going to be identical for the tasks, but you'll have different, a different label space for different tasks. Um, so for example, say you want to be able to look at an image and be able to detect whether or not the person has blue eyes or brown eyes, um, or detect their hair color or something like that, then the, dis the images are gonna be the same. You're gonna have the same training data set, but you'll have different label spaces. Um, and uh, your, your goal is to basically be able to predict those different labels. And this is what's called multi-label classification or multi-label learning. Um, scene understanding is another example of this, where you have a data set of different scenes and you might wanna be able to predict the depth from that scene or key points from that scene or surface normals for that scene. Okay, and then there's also examples where maybe the loss function varies across tasks as well. Um, so you might have tasks that have, some tasks that have discrete labels and some tasks that have continuous labels. And then you might have different loss functions that correspond to those different kinds of labels. And also um, maybe you're in a scenario where you care about multiple different kinds of metrics and uh, and you want to be able to optimize all of those metrics. Um, sometimes this is referred to as multi-objective optimization. Great, any questions on, on what a task is and what multitask learning problems look like? Okay, great. So, we want to be able to learn uh, to optimize and, and solve multitask learning problems. And one thing that's super important in these problems is to be able to actually have some sort of descriptor that indicates what the task is. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, um, if we have different loss functions across different tasks, are we going, still going to assume that they can be combined in some way into a single objective? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about forming the objective of these problems later in the lecture, but the short answer is yes. And we're going to assume that each of these loss functions 
follow the typical signature of a loss function in that they're going to be outputting a scalar value that you want to minimize. Um, and this means that it's usually fairly straightforward to combine them um, by, for example, by summing the loss functions or something like that. Right, so the question is, um, should they map to the same output space? And um, I guess that, that's a little bit more complicated. They could potentially map to different spaces and then you might want to weight them in different ways. Um, weight one loss function higher than another loss function if it, if it is basically on a different scale, for example. Good questions. Okay, so uh, typically you'll have for some form of task descriptor and this will essentially tell the model what task it's supposed to be doing, what task it's supposed to be solving. Sometimes the task will just be fairly obvious from the input X. For example, if you're trying to recognize characters in different languages, you might be able to detect the language from the character itself, and then you don't even need a task descriptor. Um, but essentially, you'll wanna be able to have a description of the task and pass this into the network in addition to passing in the input X. Um, and so now the function that we're going to be trying to learn is not f of y given x, but f of y given x comma this task descriptor. Um, so uh, for example, maybe you are given a, a title of a paper and you want, want to predict the length of the paper, but maybe you also want to produce a summary of the paper. Or uh, maybe you're uh, a PhD student and, and you're, you're getting a lot of review, review requests and you also want to train a network to actually review the paper for you as well. Um, rather than actually having to read the paper. Um, so th these might be examples of different tasks. And then uh, the task descriptor might be something like a one-hot encoding of the task index. So you could give it an index of zero if you want the length of the paper, an index of one if you want a summary of the paper, or an index of two if you want a review of the paper. Um, or if you have some metadata about the different kinds of tasks that you want to solve, then you can provide that sort of information into the network. So if you want to essentially have different tasks correspond to different people, different users, then you could pass in different attributes or different features of those users into the network. Um, you could also pass in a language description of the task. And this is fairly common in uh, a lot of NLP examples where you could say, give me a review of the paper or give me a summary of the paper or just TLDR, for example. Um, and this is often referred to as prompting in the NLP literature. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So um, the question is, can you actually learn this task descriptor as well in the process? Can you tweak it? And maybe you could actually get something better than a better language description of the task, for example. Um, in the standard multitask learning scenario, we'll, we will not be considering learning this. We'll just be fixing it. But actually, as you start to learn these kinds of task descriptors, you're moving a lot more towards a meta-learning scenario. Um, and we'll talk about those in, in the future lectures. Cool. Um, and you, another example of what this task encoding could be is like a formal specification of the task. Okay, and then once you have, once you set up your model and you're conditioning it on your task descriptor, then at that point, uh, you're essentially ready to, to optimize and, and run multitask learning. And the vanilla objective looks something like this, where the, um, where the, you're just kind of summing over your different loss functions. So you take the loss functions for all of your tasks. You have capital T tasks and you, you sum them and then optimize your parameters over the sum of the loss functions. And then from here, we actually have a, a pretty large design space for solving these problems. So we can decide different kinds of model architectures and different ways of conditioning on Z we can decide, do we want to actually change this objective? This is the most vanilla objective that we can consider, uh, but there are other ways, other objectives that we could consider. And then we also need to decide how we want to optimize it. Uh, you could run a variant of stochastic gradient descent, um, but there are also other ways that you can consider optimizing it as well. So um, the model is, is like thinking about how we should condition on Z um, and, and also thinking about what objectives we should use. Um, and then ultimately what, what, how we should optimize that objective. Okay, so um, in the bulk of this lecture, we'll talk about these three design choices, but this will be kind of the overall setup of the problem. Any questions on the overall setup? Yeah. 
Sorry, can you repeat that? Right, so the question is, what do I mean by condition on Z? Um, essentially, what I mean is just passing Z into the network. Uh, and so instead of just passing an X into the network, you're going to pass in both X and Z. Um, so by conditioning, I just mean passing it into the model. Um, or more formally, conditioning the, the probability, the distribution given by the network, at, uh, not just on X, but also on Z. Yeah? Uh, so what's the difference? So like, if I just concatenate X and Z and bring them to my model, uh, are, are they same? Yeah, so essentially the vanilla setup is just to concatenate X and Z and then optimize uh, your, your objective. Yep, exactly. So you can add, add a feature to your input, which is Z. Um, you can optimize it. It does turn out that oftentimes just concatenating them and optimizing doesn't work that well for a number of reasons. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, why it doesn't work well and, and how we can mitigate it. Yeah? Yeah, so the question is for different tasks, can you have different output spaces? And um, yes, and so that will essentially come into the, the modeling design choices. And you can essentially, for example, have different heads of the network output different, um, different outputs based off of, um, based off of Z. Uh, or you could have it be something that's like a, a recurrent neural network that iteratively outputs different things and decides how, much, how many dimensions to use based off of the, the task descriptor. In the back? So it's a bit tangential, but with the way that the MCL objective is formulated, I was just curious if it's been shown that like, the presence of spurious correlates for a given task in the multicast setting is like lower than in the MCL like, task setting because like, the correlate might not hold us up in the process of the tasks. Right, so the question is, um, do you, does the multitask problem help with spurious correlations, um, help, help the model be more robust to spurious correlations by, um, by, by nature of essentially having some tasks maybe don't have that spurious correlation and, and other tasks do? Um, there isn't any work that formally studies this, but um, the, I guess one thing that I will, we actually have some ongoing research that studies something along these lines, and we actually find that um, it doesn't make it more robust, essentially. Uh, the network sort of, often, oftentimes the network will specialize for different things, and if one task has various correlations, it will, like, essentially pay attention to those various correlations, even if it shouldn't be. Yeah? Um, so I spoke about the data generate distribution, so that's what is the thing is. So for the most one case, what is VPX actually that say like why the log Yeah, so we'll talk about the multitask reinforcement learning case um, like in, in several lectures, but um, essentially you can think about different reinforcement learning tasks as different MDPs with um, potentially different dynamics, different reward functions, sometimes also different state spaces and action spaces, depending on the problem setup. Okay, um, so let's move on. So we have these uh, three different design choices, uh, and we're going to go through each of these uh, in sequence, and we'll start with uh, the modeling choice. So we need to be able to condition on the task. We need to be able to pass as input the task descriptor. And uh, for the time being, let's just assume that this task descriptor is a one-hot vector, uh, meaning that, um, for example, if you have two tasks, uh, you just encode uh, those two tasks using vectors that look like this, uh, that are just like representing the um, representing the integers corresponding to those task identifiers. Now, I have a question for you, which is that say that it's the task. Um, say that you have something like this. Maybe you just have two tasks, and you are representing the two tasks with this one hot task uh, identifier. How should you go about passing as input this task identifier if you want to share as little as possible between the two networks? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So you could, um, you could essentially have kind of multiple neural networks. I'm not great at drawing neural networks quickly, but you could have multiple neural networks and then essentially just index into those neural networks um, with these two functions, and that will share essentially nothing between the two tasks. Any other ideas to add? Yeah? Uh, I can pass the index to uh, by the 
So, so these so these impacts is embedded in a different vector representation. Um, so you're saying to embed this into a vector representation? Yeah. And then pass that into the network? Yeah. yeah, so you could definitely do something like that. And essentially if you and actually if you pass this into a linear network it, or a linear layer, it will naturally do that already. Um, but if you pass it into the network and then pass it as input X, then the following layers will still be uh, shared between the two tasks. Um, and so if you want to share as little as possible, um, you could do something closer to, to what was suggested earlier, where you um, have kind of essentially two separate parts of the model and just index into those two separate parts of the model using uh, the task identifier. Um, so kind of visually what that might look like is something like this. If you have T tasks, um, you could essentially have T subnetworks for each of those tasks and then gate the output of those networks with your one hot task identifier to produce the label. Um, and so this is essentially identical to just training the tasks independently. But the reason why I bring this up is that it's useful to understand that um, there are kind of these two extremes and one of the extremes is where you are essentially just doing independent training. And if you do use a form of multiplicative gating, the network could actually choose to share very little between the two tasks or between all the tasks. Was there a question? Yeah. Is this saying that we're passing the, whatever input to all of the networks and then like just taking the one uh, that matches the correct uh, task? Yeah, exactly. So, so um, we're essentially taking the input, passing it into all of these subnetworks, and then just taking the output that um, that indexes into the task. Of course, this is computationally doesn't make any sense because um, you're doing like t times more computation than what you need to do. Um, it's more of a thought exercise than something that you would actually do in practice. Great, so this is essentially a way to do like independent training of tasks within a single model. Um, and one thing that you can note is even though this is a single network, you can view this sort of as a single network learning all the tasks, there isn't any shared parameters. There aren't any parameters that are shared between the two tasks in the sense that um, if these have completely separate weights, then the weights that are being used to solve one task are completely different than the weights that are being, to, that are completely disjoint from the weights that are being used to solve another task. Okay, great. And then um, there's also the other extreme. So that's one extreme, which is that you're sharing nothing between the two tasks. And um, the other extreme is something where you essentially just concatenate uh, Z into the network at some point. And if you do something like this, um, especially if you concatenate Z towards the end, then you're going to be sharing all of the weights between the different tasks. Um, and so what I mean by this is you can essentially just concatenate Z with one of your, the intermediate layers of your network. And yeah, to get the prediction, you're running, just running this, a forward pass through this network. Yeah. With a large enough network and if the tasks are different enough, this solution would kind of collapse to the previous one, right? Like if the network starts learning like just separate weights to you based on the index. Yeah, that's a great question. If you do give this a large enough network, um, in principle it could represent the function that was on the previous slide. It would need to learn that, it, and that wouldn't be the most natural solution for it to learn, but, um, but it can still represent that. Um, so essentially here all the parameters are here, yeah. Is there a reason for yeah, so the question is, what if, what if different P of X's um, have different modalities, for example? Like maybe one task is over text, one task is over images. Um, and in that case, you can essentially form a network that takes as input, kind of has two legs of the network that has two encoders for those different modalities, and then at some point combines them together. Um, that might be a scenario where the tasks are very different and you don't get a lot of benefit from putting them together, um, but at the same time, it, it is something that you could do if the tasks are, and it could be helpful if the tasks are sufficiently related. Yeah? Is this the same as just training all the tasks in one network? Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is training all the tasks in one network. Okay. 
Great. Um, so I guess one side note is that all the parameters are shared except for the parameters that are directly following z. Um, but this is um, somewhat of a not not a super important point. Okay. Um, so. That was essentially one view on the architecture of multitask learning where you have these kind of two extremes where you're sharing all the parameters or sharing none of the parameters. Um, another way to view this is to split the parameters into shared parameters and task specific parameters. And then our objective looks something like this where you have these both shared parameters and the task specific parameters and you're trying to optimize the sum of the loss functions where um, of course the the loss function for one task will only affect the shared parameters and the parameters for that task and won't affect task specific parameters for other tasks. Um, and this is, uh, this is a pretty important uh, thing to think about because if you do actually put everything into the same network, then that means that the loss function is affecting the shared parameters um, for all of the tasks. Whereas if you do put them in completely separate networks, then the optimization ends up looking very different because there aren't any shared parameters. Okay, and then from this standpoint, uh, choosing how to condition on Z can be viewed as essentially being equivalent to choosing how and where to share parameters. And so uh, if, you, if you condition on Z as like the gating in, in the very first example, then that means you're sharing none of the parameters. Whereas if you condition on it later, that means that you're sharing many more of the parameters and you'll have this more of a joint optimization rather than an independent optimization. Okay, um, so that's essentially some of the, the, the basics of this sort of model architecture choices and, and, and so forth. Um, now we'll just go through some common choices that people use in practice when actually trying to train these multitask networks. And so one uh, common choice is to concatenate like we saw before. And what this looks like is you have some input. Um, these can be activations or something like that, or it could just be the input itself. You concatenate, with, uh, you concatenate that input with the task representation Z. And then you pass the rest through, um, through your neural network. Yeah? So you're wondering if um, some architectures kind of flexibly assign shared parameters? Yeah, so the you can have networks that essentially dynamically choose which parameters to share and which parameters not to share. Um, for the purposes of this slide, I consider any shared parameters as ones that are being optimized jointly from the very beginning of training. Um, and oftentimes, if you do have these decisions of like what to share versus not what to share in, in the network and so forth, um, it often has a somewhat similar effect as sharing all of them because the network can implicitly choose to um, choose, even if you put everything in a single network, it can implicitly choose to rep represent things independently. Um, and so it often has to do with the, the optimization standpoint, like the, the optimization problem and so forth. Um, but you can certainly, there's actually a, a pretty huge design space here in terms of how, um, how you condition and how you share parameters. Cool, so concatenation-based conditioning is, is one approach that people use fairly frequently. Another approach is to condition in an additive, additive fashion. And uh, the way this works is you take your conditioning representation, pass it through a linear layer to get an embedding of that task representation, and then add that to uh, the input to get the, um, the, the next representation. And you can then pass the output into a neural network and so forth. Now these are two choices. Uh, and one thing that you might notice is that these two choices are actually equivalent. Um, can anyone tell me why these are equivalent? Yeah? Can still be passed through a parameter anyways. Maybe like, it'll be, they might be added in the linear layer. Mm -hmm. Anything to add or, yeah? Uh, since you're passing, before adding it, you're passing the linear layer, 
those ways around the same thing will happen in the, when you print that meeting you have weights that you learn in the same way. Cool. So exactly um, what this looks like is you have, uh, say you have x and z. If you concatenate them into a single vector and then you pass them through a linear layer like this, uh, say that this linear layer is broken up into two halves with two weights, then this is equivalent to w1 times x plus w2 times z. Um, and this is additive conditioning, and this is concatenation. Um, so they aren't exactly equivalent if you, um, you basically just have to break this weight matrix into these two uh, weight matrices to see that um, from this standpoint, uh, you can see the equivalence. Um, and here's a, on the slide, here's a diagram that, that also illustrates that where W is broken up into these two matrices, and then when you do the matrix multiply, you get these two components, and then you add them two to get together. Um, to get this equation. Question. Yeah, um, there definitely are, are algorithms that do that. I'm not going to cover them in this lecture, but um, the, the question, person asking the question can ask that on ed, and I'm happy to give them pointers. Yeah. Uh, well. um, you're asking W2 is missing a second condition. Yeah. So you're saying they're exactly the same, right? But I feel like I understand that for me, the weight matrix one dimension would be twice the size in the first conditioning form and this is the second conditioning form. Um, I guess it, so you're saying that the. Because the input is not direct. Yeah, so for them, in, in these diagrams, for them to actually like fully be equivalent, you would essentially need to pass the input through a linear layer. And so, yeah, that, that's something that's important for them to be equivalent. Yeah. yeah. And if the input came from a neural network and isn't the raw input, then the previous layer would count as this. And, um, but yeah, I guess this, this diagram should be probably updated to have the linear layer in there in the top right. Yeah? Um, right, so I guess uh, I just looked at the kind of the, the weight of this layer. Um, typically a fully connected layer will have both a weight and a bias term. Um, and so if you, if you actually include that, um, that bias term right here, you'll have a plus B here. And then if you break that into B1 and B2, then you'll also have a kind of a plus B1 and a, um, actually, sorry. Uh, I guess it'll still just be plus B, but yeah. So essentially the, the um, this is just trying to show the, um, the bias term essentially. Okay, um, so additive and concatenation are basically equivalent if you're kind of, um, if they are kind of prepended with these linear layers. Uh, and so it's not necessarily worth, essentially the takeaway is don't try both of them because uh, it's, uh, you just need to try one of them and they'll, they'll be this, give you probably the same uh, result. Um, another choice in terms of conditioning is to use a multi-head architecture where you have essentially different output heads for the model. Um, and this can be especially helpful if you have different label spaces, um, like one label is continuous, one label is discrete, and so forth. Um, and uh, another common choice is to use multiplicative conditioning. So instead of adding the output, you actually multiply the outputs, um, or multiply the representation of the task in an element-wise fashion. Now, one thing you might be wondering is, well, okay, why, would we, why might we use multiplicative conditioning? And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is that it's going to be more expressive per layer than additive conditioning. Uh, you can't represent this sort of multiplicative conditioning in a single layer if you're just doing concatenation. Uh, you can actually represent it with multiple layers because, of, um, because neural networks can represent any function, um, but it gives you more expressivity per layer. 
Um, and if you also remember the multiplicative gating that we talked about before, where you have these different networks and you gate the output, this sort of conditioning can represent that form of gating as well. And it allows you to actually um, essentially dynamically choose which parts of the network um, should be used for which tasks. Um, so essentially multiplicative conditioning is a way that you can generalize these independent networks as well as uh, independent heads. And so you can also represent multi multi-head architectures with this multiplicative gating. Yeah? Are there cases where you apply conditioning? Yeah, so the question is, are there cases where you might apply different conditioning to different layers? Um, I guess the, I mean, the one answer is that the design space is, is very large and you can choose to really do whatever you want in the design space depending on what you find works well. Um, I don't think that there's any particular cases where it would be especially helpful to have uh, multiple kinds of conditioning, um, but it's certainly kind of within the design space of, of models. Yeah? Uh, is using um, I don't know if it's really more expressive. Uh, I think that if you do it like at every layer, for example, I would, uh, I think it's strictly more expressive in that sense. Um, in the sense that the, like you can represent additive conditioning by essentially having part of your input be like all ones, for example. And then when you do the multiplication, then for those, that all ones, then you'll get uh, basically just concatenation. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's more expressive if you have a high dimensional enough input. Um, but it isn't necessarily like strictly more expressive given the same dimensionality. Yeah. So can we consider this? Um yeah, so after you pass as input the uh, this, this work out. so after you pass as input the representation, the task representation through this linear network, you can already think of that blue vector in the top right as a task representation uh, or a task embedding um, because it's uh, especially if you have a one hot, uh, task representation that you're passing as input, then essentially the the weights or the um, the rows or something of, of that weight matrix, or, or sorry, the columns of that weight matrix will essentially just be an embedding of each of the tasks. Um, and then the way that you can get condition on that, those different kinds of embeddings, um, that's essentially what these different choices correspond to. Cool. Um, so those are. I mean, additive and multiplicative are essentially the most basic choices of conditioning. There's also a lot more complex choices. Um, so here are, are some examples of, of different kinds of architectures that people have proposed. Um, in general, I think that when it, guard, when it comes to conditioning, there isn't really um, any like specific like science for how to do it. Um, it's often very problem dependent. Uh, it's largely guided by intuition and knowledge about the problem, um, and really more of an art than a science. Yeah. Have you ever conditioned like at the beginning, like fully at the beginning, for example, for an image, just add two layers or one layer, when you have all ones, all zeros, or all twos, depending on which task you want to work with, and add that, just like as the image size, add that, so you have like the you have four channels. Yeah, absolutely. So you can condition at the very beginning, you can condition later in the network, and so forth, and the multiplicative and additive conditioning that we've talked about can all be applied at different parts of the network. Um, and in terms of like the intuition that I'm talking about here, um, maybe you have a problem where you'd imagine that you want to process the image differently for different tasks. And in that case, earlier conditioning is probably a better choice than later conditioning. Um, and, and like I'm saying here, it's usually something that's quite problem dependent um, and is usually based more on intuition and what you find works what, on kind of experimentation rather than um, any sort of like science that will tell you exactly what architecture to use. Okay, cool. Um, 
So that's it for the model architecture for multitask learning. The next question is how we should form the objective. And so we talked before about how we can just use this sort of vanilla objective of just adding up the task losses and optimizing. Uh, but often we might want to weight different tasks differently. Um, and we might want to be able to define a weighted objective where we apply a weight W in front of the loss function and minimize this weighted sum of the objectives. Um, and then of course the question comes is like, how do you choose this WI? Does anyone have thoughts on how they would go about choosing these weights? Uh, could be based on uh, the size of your data set. So, so you might want to balance that. Right? So would you have a higher weight for larger data sets or smaller data sets? Smaller weights for larger. Smaller weights for larger data sets. Yeah. Well, I guess on that note, you may um, oftentimes the loss function you'll want to for a different task will want to average it over the data set so that um, so it's not larger for for larger data sets and so forth. But yeah, that makes sense. Uh, in the back. Yeah, so um, the suggestion was based on a paper on the website. Uh, you can look at the, like, what's called the heteroscedastic, heteroscedastic uncertainty of the model and use that to, to weight and weight differently, for t weight differently for tasks that you're very certain about versus tasks that you're less certain about. Yeah. So look at the scales of the losses themselves, and uh, if you notice that one loss is on a higher scale, then maybe you weight it lower, and, and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, I commit to with another set of hyperparameter, which is uh, a higher level. I, mean, I can use some like evolutionary strategy. Yeah, so you can have the weights themselves be hyperparameters and, and optimize those hyperparameters. Um, in that case, one question that comes up is if they're hyperparameters, what objective are you optimizing for those hyperparameters? Um, and so you do eventually at some point need to have some final objective, even if you're going to be optimizing the weights themselves. Um, although you could optimize them with respect to like the, the vanilla objective, for example. Yeah? Uh, you can also treat it as a curriculum. For example, you could give high weights to more low level tasks, and then as you learn, you can uh, move the weights uh, to a higher level task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you could have a curriculum and maybe start have higher weights for easier tasks at the beginning and then move towards harder tasks in the back. I mean, generally, you'd want to weight the tasks that you care about more with higher weights. So if you have like a main task and maybe some auxiliary tasks that you're just doing to help along the learning, then you would want to weight those lower. Yeah, exactly. So if some of your tasks you don't really care about that much, but you think that they might be helpful um, as like a regularization or something, then you would want to weight those lower than, than the main task. Okay, one more. So what about making the tasks that to the tasks are very similar in the response compared to a task which is very distinct or slightly more distinct than the other tasks so that it's sort of random. Yeah, right. So if you have a collection of tasks and some are more similar than others, then um, if you have a lot of a lot of tasks that are very similar to each other and some tasks that are very different, then you might want to weight the ones that are different higher um, to kind of counterbalance the tasks that are more similar to each other. Great. So all of these are, are really, uh, I think, great answers to this question and things that are good to do when, when choosing these weights. Um, uh, and unfortunately, like the model architecture, choosing these weights is often more of an art as well and, and more problem dependent and based on your intuition. Um, and so you might try to manually determine these based on uh, importance or priority or something that you know about the kinds of tasks. Um, one thing that also came up is you could also dynamically adjust these throughout training in like a curriculum or um, through, other, uh, through other strategies as well. Um, so I'll, I'll mention two things on this slide. Uh, there's already been like lots of great ideas that have been mentioned, but um, there are various heuristics for trying to weight tasks. Uh, one example is to try to encourage gradients to have similar magnitudes um, to try to help the optimization problem. Um, and this would be an example of something that's dynamic. Um, and then one other example that I'd like to bring up uh, that actually wasn't brought up is to try to optimize for the worst case task loss. And um, this isn't useful in all scenarios, but this is useful in scenarios where 
Um, you ultimately care about all of the tasks, and you want to make sure that all of the tasks have, are optimized sufficiently well. Um, so for example, maybe different tasks correspond to different people that are using your service, and you want to be fair to all of them, and you don't want to have, to have some users that are just like the model is completely ignoring and some users that it's really paying attention to. And this sort of worst case task loss, which um, is kind of written in this equation right here, uh, will essentially try to optimize for the worst case and try to um, make sure that the, the worst user is still being uh, treated well, basically, or, or has a good loss function. Um, so this is useful for, th for fairness, for robustness, um, and so forth. And so exactly what this equation means is um, essentially you're going to be picking the loss function with the that has the highest loss currently and optimize that one. Actually optimizing this loss can be pretty difficult if you have a lot of tasks because you might need to enumerate over all the possible tasks and there are various um, kind of approximations and approaches for trying to optimize this function uh, in a more tractable way if you have a lot of tasks. Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, what was said was uh, another thing that you can do is not just have, uh, minimize losses, but also minimize the, um, the variance of the losses as well so that they, um, so that you are kind of uh, trying to get a similar loss for all of the tasks. I mean, there are some, some scenarios where, where that sort of thing will make sense. Other scenarios where, like, for example, if you have auxiliary tasks, this is probably a bad idea because then you'll focus a lot on the auxiliary tasks, potentially more so than the main task. Yeah? I guess related to that, isn't this kind of difficult to clean? Because if you're picking the loss for like a specific task and then optimizing over that, like, that you switch between the losses, don't you, like, jump around the road? Because you're, like, optimizing for that specific task and then you're switching to a completely different task without making that Yeah, I don't know if there's Yeah. So this will lead to a non-stationary optimization problem, which I think is what you're referring to, and that can be more tricky to optimize. Um, and in general, people have found, sometimes found this objective to be difficult. Uh, it does actually, there are examples of it working quite well, actually, um, where you have different <coughs> domains and you're trying to optimize for the worst case domain, and people have actually shown that this can actually help a robustness, especially if you um, think that maybe at test time your distribution over tasks might be changing then um, this will help you prepare for that sort of distribution shift. Um, but it is certainly a, a more difficult optimization problem, and methods that have used this have often introduced things like regularization to help stabilize it. Great. Um, so we've talked about the model, and we've talked about the objective. Uh, the last step is just how do we optimize the objective, optimize the model with respect to the objective. So um, say we have our kind of vanilla multitask objective. Um, really the, I'll go over kind of the basic version of how we might optimize it. So we have a set of tasks. And uh, first, we could just sample a mini batch of those tasks. Um, if, we have, if we only have a small number of tasks, then we could just sample all of the tasks. And then we'll sample a mini batch of data points for each of the tasks that we sampled. And so we'll run through the tasks that we, we sampled, select training data for each of those tasks, and then compute the loss on that mini batch. So uh, for each of the tasks that we sampled, for each of the mini batches, we'll evaluate how well the model is performing on those data points. And then ultimately uh, compute the gradient of that loss function and backpropagate it into the model's parameters to update the parameters. Um, so you can then apply your gradient with your favorite optimizer for neural networks, such as Atom or, or maybe whatever is the kind of the latest and greatest thing. Um, this is fairly straightforward. Uh, the one thing that I think is, is um, important here is that it does, um, especially if you sample all tasks in step one, this does ensure that you're going to have um, you're going to be essentially weight the tasks evenly. Like even if you have a lot more data from one task than another task, then this sort of approach will uh, make sure that you're kind of treating them with equal weight uh, rather than based off of how much data that they have. So this is usually pretty helpful. Um, 
if, if you sample all of the tasks in step one, this is also doing stratification of your batches, meaning that you're gonna have an equal amount of data for every single task in your batch. And this will lead to a lower variance gradient than if you were to just randomly sample data points, um, especially if you have like different loss functions for different tasks. So you'll have essentially in your loss function, you'll have a component for each task um, rather than just having the, the amount of, um, rather than having it be determined based on how you're sampling. Um, and one thing that's pretty important here also is for regression problems, you wanna make sure that your labels are on the same scale. And so if you have a regression problem where one problem your labels are, like range from zero to two and another problem they range from zero to 100, then implicitly that's gonna upweight the loss function for the, the wider range labels. And that might not be what you want. And so if you instead normalize your label space, then that will ensure that you have kind of equal weighting across the tasks. Okay, um, so in general, there aren't, um, this is a fairly typical way to optimize the objective and there aren't too many variations on this. Um, usually this isn't the, usually this isn't the hard part. Usually the harder part is determining the architecture or determining the, um, uh, or determining the objective to use. Okay, um, a couple challenges that I, that I wanna bring up. Um, basically what can go wrong when you actually try to implement a multitask learning system? Uh, the first challenge is negative transfer. And what I mean by this is that sometimes training the tasks independently works better than training them together. Uh, this can be a bit unintuitive, but um, this is referred to negative transfer in the sense that tasks, um, some tasks are actually adversely hurting the performance of other tasks. Um, and so as a really concrete example of this happening is if you take um, some somewhat recent approaches to uh, a version of a multitask version of CIFAR and you evaluate these different approaches. Essentially the, the, um, the first two approaches are multitask learning approaches. The third approach is this more fancy architecture called cross-stitch networks. And the last row is just independent training. Uh, what you'll notice here is that, um, so these are different multi-head architectures, cross-stitch architectures and independent training. What you'll notice here is that independent training is actually doing better than the multitask learning approaches. Uh, and this is, so an, an instance of negative transfer, it means that uh, just training on the task independently uh, and not sharing any weights is, is better in this case. Now, why might this happen? Um, it can happen for a number of reasons. It could be optimization challenges that are coming up. Um, maybe the network is having trouble finding kind of a, a solution that works for all of the tasks. Um, this could be caused by kind of interference between the tasks, between the gradients of different tasks. Um, tasks might learn at different rates. And so maybe one task is actually a lot easier. And so maybe the loss function will focus a lot on that easy task and ignore the harder task. And then once it finds a good solution for the easy task, maybe it's already kind of reached a, a part of the optimization space that's really difficult for the harder tasks. Um, it can also have to do with limited representational capacity. So uh, multitask networks often need to be a lot larger than single task networks because you're trying to do more. Um, so th yeah, these are a couple of reasons for why you could see negative transfer. Um, so what do you do if you have negative transfer? You can just share less. Um, you can move it more towards independent training. Um, of course, there might be scenarios where independent training is just the best possible thing you can do. Um, but there's a whole spectrum of what you can do. You can share fewer parameters. And it's also not just like a binary decision of whether or not to share a parameter or not. Um, there's also something, uh, well, so we talked about how you can share less parameters and you could have fewer shared parameters and more task specific parameters. Um, but there's also something called uh, soft parameter sharing. And the way this works is you have different networks for the different tasks. And you essentially try to encourage the weights to be similar to one another. Uh, and so while you're actually representing the weights completely independently, you can essentially add this top right term on the right that encourages the parameters to be similar. And this will essentially kind of tie them, like bring them closer to one another and constrain them in a way that encourages them to be similar in a softer way than like hardly constraining them to be the same. Yeah. 
process would have taken activity just um, five um, Right, so the, I guess the, the way that the, the second term is indexing onto the tasks is with this, um, with T prime rather than I. Uh, and so it's just, we're just using a different index. Um, I guess, oh yeah, so T is actually technically not defined. So yeah, that should be, um, that should be an I rather than, than a, a T. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, the, yeah, so I guess, the, I mean, the short answer is that a good way to detect negative transfer is to train independent networks and see if it's doing better. Um, and you don't need to necessarily train independent networks for all of the tasks. You could just train it for some of them and see if it's, it's worse. Uh, another way is if you have a sense for what performance you want to get, then you could try to see a performance, what performance is relative to that. But the kind of the most sure way to detect this sort of transfer is to train networks independently. Yeah? Um, I think it's pushing on that question a bit more. Is there no way to characterize whether tasks would interfere or these are just the distributions or something? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So the question is, is there a way to tell if tasks will be synergistic or not? Um, I'll talk about that a bit in like three slides. Uh, it will be rather unsatisfying, but uh, I'll talk about it a bit in three slides. Yeah. Um, I mean, constraints a big problem, having to store all the um, back propagations for each of the losses individually before they can actually the gradients. Right, so that, that's a good question. Um, I think that I... Right, so I guess in this sort of soft parameter sharing, you do need to represent the network separately and represent the gradient separately, and this does make this sort of soft par parameter sharing approach much less memory efficient. It does require a lot more memory. Um, and so if you're in scenarios where you have where you need to train fairly large networks, this approach will be kind of disadvantageous for that reason. Um, and so I guess in terms of pros and cons of this approach, it allows more fluid degrees of parameter sharing. Um, another uh, one con is that it is essentially another set of design choices and hyperparameters in terms of like how you choose this sort of soft sharing and so forth. Another downside is that it requires a lot more memory than like literally um, constraining the weights to be the same. Yeah. Uh, let's say you have 10 tasks and six of them do well, four of them don't, uh, compared to like the different tokens parts. Is there like a way to find out which task or set of tasks are, you know, the ones that are causing the negative transfer? Yeah. Um, so the question is if you have a set of tasks and maybe compared to independent training, um, some of them improve and some of them stay the same, and is there a way to detect essentially? which tasks are causing negative transfer, which tasks are causing positive transfer, and so forth. Um, if you have a lot of compute, uh, one way to do it is to try all, like training all combinations of tasks together, and that can usually give a pretty good sense for which tasks are beneficial to one another and which tasks are not. Um, in a few slides when I talk about kind of task affinity and so forth, um, I'll also mention an approach that allows you to measure this in a, less computationally intensive way. Um, uh, I won't go into some of the details, but I'll talk about it in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, multitask models are really larger than normal single task models. Um, are they like three times greater than the single task models even larger than that? If you pick three tasks, um, what are some multitask models in general like three times a single task model from the parameters? Or would it be more than that? Yeah, so I think the question is kind of referring to what I said here, which is that you may need a larger network for the multitask thing. And the question was whether do you need, does it need to be t times larger than the single task network? Um, and uh, typically it does not need to be t times larger. Typically uh, you, the network can represent things in a way that, um, that can actually share capacity in some ways. Um, and if it is t times larger, then oftentimes uh, that's usually a bad sign with regard to tra negative transfer and so forth, and you might actually be better um, trading networks completely separately. Uh, although, even if you do make it t times bigger, there still might be the benefit of better performance by, um, by training them together. Great, so the second challenge that I'll mention is the opposite of negative transfer in some ways, which is um, over, well, sort of the opposite, which is Maybe you're seeing overfitting. Uh, maybe you're seeing that 
it's fitting the training data set well and it's not fitting the test set well. Uh, and this could be in a scenario where you may not be sharing enough. And the reason why I say this is that uh, multitask learning in, in many ways can be viewed as a form of regularization because it essentially gives you more data. Um, if you have data sets for different tasks or, more, or different labels for different tasks and so forth, um, training on different tasks is essentially a, can be viewed as a form of regularization. Uh, not, this is not always a good form of regularization, of course, because you might have negative transfer, but um, if you are seeing overfitting, sharing more can be helpful because it can essentially increase the amount of regularization you have on your network. Um, and so one possible solution to this is to, to try to share more. Yeah. Putting tasks through all other tasks through the bus Can you repeat that? Like, you say, like, you're training a uh, number of tasks with, like, a shared bus or If one of those tasks learns, like, has this, like, relatively simple and learns to it, and then starts to overthink, will it screw all the other tasks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is if one of the tasks is easier and it learns very quickly, um, can that mess up the other tasks? Uh, and um, I think it's, it's, I mean, in many ways it's an empirical question and I think that it can depend on the scenario. I've, I think that I've seen scenarios where it doesn't mess things up. Uh, I've also, I think I've also seen scenarios where it can potentially mess things up. Um, I think it in many ways depends on that task. If it ends up learning very quickly and taking a, a lot of the capacity of the network, then that can be a, a problem in some ways. Um, in other cases, maybe it's just really a really easy task, like maybe it just needs to output zero always, and then it might only be affecting like the last layer, like one part of the last layer and not the entire network. Um, and so it's, it's gonna be fairly problem dependent. Okay, and then the last challenge um, that I'll bring up is what if you have a, like a lot of tasks? Um, there's a question of, should you train all of the tasks together? Which tasks will be complementary? Um, relatedly, if you have a task and you have some potential auxiliary tasks, how do you know whether you should use those auxiliary tasks or not and whether they'll be helpful? And it kind of relates to the question of, yeah, will two tasks be helpful for one another? Do we know if um, we'll see negative transfer or not? Should we train them together or not? Um, the bad news is that there's like no kind of closed form solution that will just like, where you can like, take some data sets and, t and tasks and it will tell you the task similarity. Um, nothing like that really exists. And the reason for that is, as is actually that task similarity and the whether they'll have a positive effect on optimization can de depend on a huge number of factors. It can depend on the architecture that you're using, um, what the model knows versus doesn't know, like the grasping example that I gave on Monday, if you wanna grasp and pour or grasp and click or something, then if the model knows how to grasp, then they're not gonna be, then they might not be complementary at all, whereas they might be complementary if you don't know how to grasp yet. Uh, it can depend on um, the optimizer that you're using, uh, the step size that you're using. It can depend on like a whole host of different factors. And this means that it's actually not just gonna depend on the data set and the loss function itself. Um, and I guess to illustrate kind of the, the reality of this is that actually um, one paper from a couple years ago to kind of, to measure some sort of task similarity, what they proposed is literally to try all combinations of training tasks together and use that to kind of look at the performance of, of all those combinations, uh, which is obviously combinatorially expensive, um, and use that as a way to measure task similarity. Um, the good news is that there are ways to try to approximate task similarity in a way that isn't combinatorially expensive. And it actually will draw upon some of the meta-learning ideas that we'll talk about later in the course, but um, there are some ways to try to approximate this sort of task similarity. And the way that it works is to try to first train all the tasks together in a single multitask network, and then analyze the statistics of that optimization run to compute some, some approximate measure of task affinity and then um, once you have those task affinities from that single training run, you can use that to group tasks together or do something else with it. Um, yeah, and this is, um, something like this is going to be a lot more efficient than trying to try all possible combinations of training tasks together. 
it's still somewhat dissatisfying because you still need to do one full training run of training all the tasks together. Uh, but it's at least a bit more satisfying than a combinatorial solution. And it seems quite natural to me that you would still require something like a full training run because the fact that task similarity can depend on all these factors, including optimization factors. Okay, um, so I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but if anyone's interested um, in learning more about it, there's a, a, a reference to the paper. I'm also happy to chat about it more in office hours if people are interested as well. Okay, um, so to recap multitask learning, uh, today we defined a task uh, as these data generating distributions and a loss function, which can be used to sample a train set and a test set. Uh, we talked about model architectures and how we might have used multiplicative conditioning or additive conditioning on our task descriptor. And we might wanna share more or less based on the kind of transfer that we observe from training. Uh, we also talked about the objective and the optimization process, um, such as kind of this, this weighted objective and different ways to choose weights. Uh, as well as trying to use stratified mini batches to reduce the variance of the optimization process. Great, um, so any questions on, on multitask learning before I move to kind of a case study of, of using multitask learning in a real world problem? Cool, okay. So, uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna go over the case study from this particular paper. Um, and the goal of this is uh, essentially to build a recommender system for YouTube. We wanna be able to recommend people videos to watch. And um, we wanna be able to make good recommendations for YouTube. Um, and in particular, we want to be able to uh, recommend videos on the right column. Um, this is a figure from the paper. Uh, we want to be able to kind of rank and then choose videos that would be good to show to the user in the right column. Okay, um, and why is this a multitask learning problem? Um, the reason is that there's going to be a few conflicting objectives that we are going to try to use when making recommendations. Um, and by we, I mean the authors of this paper. Um, they chose a few different objectives that they care about. One is videos that people might rank, rate highly. Another is that videos that users will share with other people. Uh, and another is videos that the user will actually watch. Um, and so th these are, in my opinion, fairly reasonable things that you might want to be able to uh, optimize. And uh, there's also this sort of implicit bias that's caused by feedback. Um, the user may have watched something because it was recommended by the system. Uh, and so this is something that's super important to be aware of in general. Um, although it's not something that, it's, it's something that this paper acknowledges, but not something that they uh, necessarily solve. Okay, so the way that they set it up is the input is what the user is currently watching, as well as some features about the user. Um, this can include their history of things that they've learned, uh, they've watched before, um, or maybe interest that they entered into, the, into YouTube or something like that. Uh, they generate a few hundred candidate videos, and then they want to be able to rank these videos. Uh, and ultimately, the ones that are at the top of the rank will be ones that they will want to recommend. So serve the, the top ranking videos to the user. Um, and so, in terms of generating the candidates, they pull videos from uh, multiple candidate generation algorithms. Uh, and this isn't really the focus of the paper, but for generating these candidates, they consider things like matching the topic of the video that the user was currently watching. Um, also looking at videos that are most frequently watched when people watch the query video um, and, and other things like that. And then kind of the main part of this paper is thinking about given all of these candidates, can you rank these candidates and pick the, predict the ones that will um, kind of, yeah, rank them and, and prioritize the, the videos that you might want to show to the user from these candidates. Okay, um, and so uh, the input here is uh, the query video, um, the candidate video. So once they have their list of candidates, they're gonna pass those candidates into their network 
to try to predict um, to try to predict uh, the engagement and satisfaction with that candidate video. And so uh, the inputs are the, the query video, the candidate video, as well as features about the user and context. Um, these are passed in as, as inputs to the neural network and they're embedded into the neural network. And uh, then we're gonna be trying to predict engagement and satisfaction. Um, engagement is, uh, can correspond to a few different things. It can correspond to binary classification tasks, like whether they're going to click on the video. Uh, it can correspond to regression tasks, which might be like, how long they spent watching that candidate video. Um, and satisfaction will be, uh, could be things like clicking the like button. So this would be a binary classification task. And uh, it can also be a regression task, such as like, if they're given a survey, like how do they rate the video? Okay, and then um, once they, the model predicts engagement and satisfaction, they use some weighted combination of these two uh, predictions to produce a score for the ranking. Um, and this, the weights for this uh, were like manually tuned essentially uh, by, the, um, by the authors or someone else. Okay, um, I guess one question for you. Uh, do you feel like these objectives are reasonable? Do you think that there are issues that might come up? Do you think they're good? Um, for example, for the time step, it should be kind of prioritized by the names of the video because the video like, time varies. Yeah, so um, for time spent, uh, the, that's a good suggestion. If you have a really long video, they might spend more time watching it. If you have a short video, they will naturally, they can't spend a long time watching it. Yeah? Yeah, so these metrics aren't necessarily including whether or not the user comments. Um, and you could look at like the sentiment of the comments, for example, as, as an additional metric to predict. Yeah? Um, they're not included. I'm going to keep in dislike button. I don't think, I don't know if there is a dislike. Is there a dislike button? Okay. 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 Maybe they also, so they might also have binary classifications to dislike, um, but that seems like a good thing to include. Yeah? Different users might have like a different threshold for whether they click the like button or whether they share it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So a lot of these things might depend on the user and this might be pretty challenging. Using the user features might hopefully be helpful for that, but um, at the same time, it's something that's important to keep in mind. Yeah? Um, I mean, this is more of like a strategy thing for YouTube, but YouTube's form of like revenue is ads and not all videos have the same number of ads so you might want to prioritize videos that have ads yeah so if you want to maximize revenue then you might want to um, consider whether the candidate video has ads or not any other thoughts one other thing that i'll that i'll add that um Kind of surprised that no one mentioned, but maybe we don't want YouTube to be maximizing time spent or something. Maybe spending a lot of time on YouTube, maybe, maybe it's a good thing for Google. Maybe it's not necessarily the best thing for their users. Um, or maybe, uh, yeah, in general, keeping in mind, um, yeah, what's good in the grander scheme of things compared to maximizing revenue is usually something that's good, not just for long-term revenue, of course, but also in terms of people's well-being and so forth as well. Okay, so um, that's the setup of the problem. Um, for the architecture, they use what they call a shared bottom model. Uh, I think this is more commonly used, more commonly referred to as a multi-head architecture. So it looks something like this, where they have the input features and then they pass this in through kind of a shared, um, shared layers and then those are passed through the different heads of the model that are independent. Um, yeah, and this can, um, this sort of architecture can potentially harm learning when the correlation between tasks is low, um, but they found it to work well in, in this setting. Oh, sorry. This is, the, I think, sorry, this is the, the first thing that they tried and they found that it actually, it did harm learning when the correlation between tasks was difficult and so it was low and so they, um, they actually didn't use, uh, well, I think they did evaluate this multi-head architecture, but they didn't use this multi-head architecture in their kind of main experiments. Uh, what they found to be helpful is to do a form of soft parameter sharing. Uh, and they referred to this as a multi-gate mixture of experts. 
where they essentially have these different modules, um, these different experts, and then they, um, based on kind of features from the shared layers at the bottom, they will gate the kind of which experts they're using for which tasks. Um, and they're gonna gate in a way that's actually dependent on the input. And this means that maybe uh, for some users, you might have some modules being used or, or some kinds of videos, you might have some modules being used and so forth. Um, so uh, I guess getting back to one of the questions earlier, this is actually a way to allow the network to sort of dynamically choose uh, what is being used for which tasks and, and which users as well. Um, I don't have time really to go through this, but there's kind of a few more details on exactly how this is implemented, where you essentially um, uh, have the different, um, you're trying to basically decide which expert to use for a given input and a given task. Um, and you can, you do the gating through this sort of multiplicative interaction, and then once you choose the experts that you're using, you sum over the kind of the weighted outputs. Um, and then once you, once you have the output of, of that module, there's also um, some of these task-specific neural networks that are the heads of the network. Okay, um, and then they implemented this in TensorFlow, uh, which isn't too surprising, on TPUs. Uh, they trained it um, in temporal order, and so they get data in a stream, and they, tra they ran, ran training continuously, always consuming the most recent data. Uh, and they evaluated uh, offline AUC and squared error metrics in terms of like their ability to predict clicks, their ability to, to predict whether or not a user would rate something or like something. Um, and then they also did online A-B testing uh, um, in comparison to the system that's in production. And this, these were live metrics that were looking at the time spent, um, survey responses, and the rate of dismissals. Uh, and one thing that th um, that's especially important in this application is computational efficiency. Uh, they have a ton of data, and, um, and you want to be able to actually evaluate this model quickly as well. Okay, um, so the results uh, from the uh, live A-B test are here. And so they are evaluating the, um, the multi-head architecture, the, the more basic architecture, as well as the mixture of experts with either four experts or eight experts. And um, it's a bit small, but what, what you can see here is um, in comparison to the production system, they see a, uh, in both an improvement in both engagement as well as satisfaction uh, of about 0.45% and 3% uh, for those two metrics respectively with the, the eight mixture of experts model. Um, so this is, in my opinion, pretty impressive because I would have guessed that the production system is pretty good uh, at recommending videos. And um, if you can also actually visualize how it's utilizing experts for different tasks. And you see that for some tasks it's utilizing some experts and for other tasks it is choosing to utilize other experts. Um, and uh, so it's kind of interesting to look at these kinds of visualizations. And Visualizations like this can also give you a sense for task affinity um, after you train the network on all the tasks, of course. Um, and then one other detail that they mentioned is that they uh, found that there was actually, in some of their training runs, sometimes the gates would just like polarize and would be, um, uh, would, um, it would choose just to use like only one expert, for example, for a task. And they found that it was pretty important to use dropout on the experts to encourage it to not like choose just one expert for one task and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, they found that to be, be helpful to uh, improve training stability there. 